Elia, one thing I wanted to, to get your perspective on, uh, again, because I think you're one of the most qualified in this space for this, uh, is around Ethereum Classic. Now, what, what I want perspective on is, once, once it had the 51% attack recently, how, how should blockchains be viewed once this occurs? I mean, should, should they then be seen as, as compromised? I mean, how, how should the, the, the greater ecosystem view these projects, these protocols, when something major like that happens? Should they be disbanded? I mean, what, I mean, what are the kind of thoughts and perspectives you have on that? Well, you know, it's kind of funny to say, here's your security model. Like, if it rains, I'll bring an umbrella. And then it, 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 you step outside the assumptions of what makes your system secure, and then suddenly everybody complains the system's not secure. Proof of work only works if the majority of the miners are honest. Uh, so in, if there are cases where they're not, it's not a failure of proof of work. It's not a failure of the cryptocurrency. Uh, it's just basically a, a, a scenario that uh, that your model doesn't cover. Uh, just like, you know, a lot of applications aren't so secure if somebody has access to your laptop or your cell phone. They're able to look at things. Who cares if you're using PGP if I have access to your application and I can use it to decrypt your email messages? That's not a failure of PGP. And that's not a failure of the protocol or the cryptography. It's just that security model doesn't cover that type of attack. Now, uh, what is much more meaningful is not the attack. It's how the community responds to the attack and how you move beyond that, what innovation you bring, what social processes you bring, uh, how much resilience you have. If you look at the history of Bitcoin, it is littered with incidents, interpersonal drama, exchanges being hacked, collapse of Mount Cox, the Silk Road dilemma. There's so many incidents around, yet 10 years later, Bitcoin's still here. People are still loyal to, people still like building on it. So who cares if proof of work can have scenarios where 51% attack occurs, the minority chain will still be honest and eventually will overcome the dishonest majority and become the majority and that'll become the legitimate chain. So it's a self-healing resilient system. And socially the system is very strong and very powerful. So uh, that's the way I look at these things. I'm less draconian about it. If your end goal is to hand the driver keys over to machines and AI and assume that the protocols are infallible and they'll never be wrong, uh, you're always gonna be disappointed because these protocols and machines are built by human beings, not God. So no matter how good they are, uh, the machines will eventually have some flaw that requires human intervention to fix them. The strength is that you can come together in a decentralized way to fix it without creating a god, without creating a dictator, a beneficent leader, and saying this leader will lead us out of this. If you have to keep regressing to centralization to solve the problems of decentralization, you're neither decentralized nor worthy of it. So, uh, so that's how we should judge these types. Now, in particular with Ethereum Classic, you know, we're a bit frustrated in that ecosystem. You know, we're a proponent of the code as law approach, or at least the option of code as law. But uh, we tried to innovate there for a long time. We created the Mantis client. Uh, we had some great ideas about how to introduce DAGs and a treasury system, financial sustainability, so that we could actually be competitive and not succumb to ICO mania. Uh, and there was a dev team there that controlled the majority of the nodes and a lot of the mind share, and they just really wanted to keep things the same way, as if Vitalik's vision was okay. Even though we disagree with him on something, his vision's still law, okay. It's, it's like one of those Japanese paradoxical situations where the emperor is both right and wrong. You know, you disagree with the emperor, but he's right, right? You know, so it's the same situation here. We disagree with Vitalik, but he's right. It's crazy, crazy cognitive fallacy. Uh, and you know, it was really difficult for us to actually have any meaningful impact on the roadmap. And we were worried that if we didn't innovate and move quickly, that adoption would lag, the chain would continue to stagnate, and then inevitably it would be at risk for a 51% attack, which is what ended up happening. You know, low developer adoption, uh, not a lot of innovation, stagnation, and finally 51% attack. Uh, now they can recover for it. We'd like to stay in the ecosystem for funding so as to be found to do so. Uh, but it's a lesson about all of these projects. They're only as valuable as the, so as the social network you have around them and the innovation you have within them and your ability to bounce back from bad events. And the good news is, as an outside observer, you can see this. You can look at the Reddits and see, are people coming together and focusing on solutions? Or are they splitting into tribes and trying to find someone to blame and scapegoat? 
uh, you know, are they, you know, overcoming this and uh, and trying to uh, develop new milestones or new technologies so that they can bounce back and continue to grow, or are they hiding in their caves, and just not being responsive? And very quickly, based upon their conduct of the key leaders and in the key community members, you can tell if the cryptocurrency is solid and strong, or the cryptocurrency is not long for this world. Uh, and, uh, and that's great for us as an industry, because it means we're ultimately Darwinian. Uh, you know, the bad ideas will sink to the bottom, and the good ideas will float to the top, and very quickly we'll end up with a much more resilient and strong ecosystem. Oh, well, I appreciate uh, the canon response, Charles. It, it was very interesting hearing your perspective on that, and I think you touched on a point that, um, that I may have not given enough consideration to was the social aspect because you know I think the price of a coin is a good indicator you know if you if you kind of take the median and block out the noise is a good indicator of overall sentiment and thus the social construct of how people are feeling about it at any given time and one thing that 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 really surprised me as is the resilience of the ethereum classic coins price despite the attack so you know, coming from your perspective, that's really telling me that there is people that still believe in it, that people that's, you know, it has a strong community, that people still see value in it. And I guess yeah. when you when you take the ideals of decentralization, that's just as important of a fact as anything, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I tend to concern myself a bit less with price because it's easy to gain that. I mean, you have to look at a lot of factors like liquidity, price over a length of time, the ratio of the price to Bitcoin. You also have to look at things like the amount of installed nodes, if that's increasing or decreasing, the amount of transactions going on in the network, how many surrogates you have in the network. There's a lot of factors there, but uh, price can be a good market-based aggregation of how these things work, uh, but it's not the end-all be-all. You know, I've been in it long enough to see the top 10 change many, many, many times. So you come in, you come out of the top ten. It's like okay, uh, you know, and I, it, 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 just wait your turn. You'll, you, you never lose your, you don't, you don't lose it. You just, you just lose your turn. You'll be back. <laughs> you'll be all, you know. Yeah.